Christmas has passed. One thing I've learned about Christmas is this. Not everybody is excited about Christmas. How do I know that? People say they are, uh, they look forward to it, but really I know they're not because they want to take Christ out of it or Christ is already left out of it. If you go to the grocery store or Sam's or whatever you want to go to and you look for something uh, to put in your yard or a lighting fixture or something like that, you cannot find one of the nativity scene. If you go to Walmart, it's the same thing. It's very, very difficult. You buy Christmas cards, it's difficult there. It's becoming much harder and harder to find things that represent Christ on the day that we celebrate his birth. Very difficult. In our passage today, we're going to find out about a man and a group of people who want to proclaim they're excited about the birth of Christ. But the reality is that that's just a put on, that's just a facade, and they really hate the idea of the birth of Christ. Let's find out how God uses three wise men uh, or more to help, help us understand the true meaning of Christ, who he is, and how we should celebrate his birthday. Stay tuned. This lesson is going to be fantastic. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III, bringing you the Sunday School lesson for the last Sunday of the year, December 31st, 2023. The title of the lesson is called The Faith of the Wise Man. The Faith of the Wise Man. We'll look at the Gospel of Matthew, we'll go to chapter 2, and we'll look at the verses 1 through 12. That's Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. The Faith of the Wise Man. Before we get started, I want to just thank you for joining me on the day. I've been away for a couple of weeks, uh, just had some uh, personal matters to attend to, and uh, just thank you for coming back and listening to me. So we're back on track. Uh, before we get started on this lesson, just want to uh, invite you to subscribe, to like, to share, to tell people about this lesson if you believe it will be a benefit to them. Uh, let's get right into this lesson. It's an exciting lesson. The reason why I'm excited about it is because it's today, it's time after Christmas. It's time has passed, maybe one, two years after Christmas. This is the setting. And uh, my thought is that everybody gets real hyped up for Christmas. But what about the time after Christmas? How do we respond? And this lesson helps us to do that, helps us to see Christmas in the right perspective, too, and who we are actually celebrating. So let's look at, we got Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And the setting is this. Jesus has been born, uh, and the shepherds have come. They have uh, paid their tribute to Jesus Christ. But in this setting here, uh, we're going to be looking at wise men who have come, but it's about one to two years later. So this is not around the time of the birth of Christ. It's, he's a toddler. Uh, he's walking. He's not crawling on four legs. He's eating on his own. He's, he's, he's been weaned, all those things. He's about two years old. And we're going to find out later in the passage why we believe that or know that he's about one to two years old, probably closer to two years old. Uh, right here we have uh, King Herod is going to be the king of Judea. He's an appointed king from the Roman government. Uh, that doesn't sit well with the Jewish people. They believe the king should come from a lineage of David. They don't accept him as king of the Jews. There is conflict be him, between him. The Jews don't like him. He really doesn't like them. Uh, Herod the Great is really a half-Jew. He's an Edomite. He's an Idumean, meaning that... Uh, he is from the descendant of Esau, not Jacob. His mother was from Arabia. So he is not a full-blood full Jewish person. 
uh, to the eyes of the Jewish people, he's not a Jewish person at all. And he doesn't deserve to be their king, but he's appointed by the Roman government to be king. And guess what? He covets this position that he has. He doesn't want to let go of it. Uh, he had, he's called Herod the Great because he built, built great monuments. He was a, a builder. He, he uh, rebuilt uh, the second temple into a, a monument. Uh, this was the one that was torn down in 70 AD. This is the temple in which Jesus was in and out of. Uh, he took, um, I believe it was Zechariah's temple and uh, just built it even greater. It took about 28, 30 years to get this thing done. It was well past his lifetime to get that whole temple completed. It was a monument. So, but he had a dark side. He was insecure. He felt threatened about his position. Uh, uh, he would, uh, even though his reign was mostly peaceful, about the last 10 years, which is in this setting, uh, his reign was horrific. Uh, anybody he felt that was a threat to him, he wanted to kill. He killed two of his sons because he thought they were rising up against him. He killed his favorite wife uh, because of some other reason. Uh, in his deathbed, he had people killed so that they can at least mourn about his death. Last 10 years, he was uh, a, a murderous king. He would kill in the blink of eye, especially if he saw it was a threat to the kingdom. So that gives you a little uh, setting right here. Did not trust anybody. Totally insecure. So here we have, now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, okay, of Judea, okay, there's two Bethlehems, a Bethlehem of Judea and a Bethlehem of Galilee. So Matthew here is, wants us to know that Jesus was born in the Bethlehem of Judea because it was prophesied that he would be. Uh, and so he's laying out, um, he went, Matthew writes his gospel for two reasons. He's going to speak to the Jew first, to the Gentile second. He wants the Jews to know that Jesus Christ is the Messiah that was prophesied. He is the Messiah that they're waiting on, that, that has been talked about. He is the Messiah. He is their Savior. And then he also wants the Gentiles to know that, he is, that Jesus is the Messiah for all nations, not just the Jews, but for everybody. So in Matthew's eyes, his message is that Jesus is the Messiah for all, and that's what he's trying to portray. So he identifies the Bethlehem in which Jesus was born in for uh, prophecy reasons, to let them know, again, this is the Messiah that you've been waiting for. And it says, in the last day of Herod the king, uh, I told you a little about it, about it, about Herod, how bad he was, but he was a king, appointed by the Roman government. Uh, this is... Herod dies in 4 BC, and that's, uh, and that's on record. And guess what? Christ is born, uh, according to uh, uh, estimates, he's born in 5 BC, 6 BC, or even as late as 7 BC. A lot of times we think Jesus, when he died, he was 33 years old because Luke talks about when he came into his ministry, he's about 30 years old. But in reality, Jesus was probably... 36 to 37 years old when he was crucified on the cross. The reason why we know that is because Herod died in 4 BC. If Christ was uh, born in 6 BC or 5 BC, he would be 36, 37 years old when he died, if you added those up there. So that's a little point of reference there. We'll see a lot of little corrections in this story that has been passed on here. But Jesus, 36, 37 years old. And he said, Herod, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, wise men come, come um, from the east to Jerusalem. Now these wise men, uh, they also called them magi. We get the word musician or magic from that. Uh, they weren't tricksters or the magicians in which we're saying, they were, which we think of, they were astrologers. They studied the stars. Uh, they studied the stars where to predict the future. Uh, they were dream interpreters. Uh, they were uh, really probably devout in what they were doing. They weren't uh, tricksters and uh, musicians that did that dealt in the dark world of dark secrets. Uh, although they were, what they were doing was not of God. 
Um, they were they were not in our eyes evil people, even though what they did was ungodly. Not in our eyes, we wouldn't see them in that day. People did not see them as evil people, but they were not saved. They were not Jews. Uh, they were from the east. Uh, there are many theories on where the east is. Let me just say this up front: we don't know where they're from. People are saying they were from uh, Persia, or Babylon. Babylon, because Babylon and Persia were known for their astrologists. They were deep into astrology. And then some other people say they were from the Orient, um, uh, parts of Asia, uh, China, South Korea, Vietnam, that way. My thought was wherever they were from, it was far away because it took them quite a while, up to two years, to get to Jerusalem, where they're from. And that's why I probably would discount Persia or Babylon because it would not take that long. It probably would take weeks to get there. If you come from the Orient, then it would seem it would take up to two years to get to Jerusalem. Those are my thoughts. That's my speculation. But in reality, we really do not know. Okay? So, wise men, okay, the Magi, uh, they looked upon it in a positive sense. In our society, we look upon them, um, we look at magicians and magic probably from a Christian point of view in a negative sense, but uh, Matthew doesn't, doesn't put them in a negative light uh, as far as that. But they're not Christian, they're not Jewish people. They come from the east to Jerusalem, all right, uh, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? So they travel from the east, they make their way to Jerusalem, and they say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And then, then, then they, they, they're going to explain how things happen. King of the Jews is a title for the Messiah. So they're asking the king of the Jews, the person who was uh, the Messiah, they have heard about the prophecies of the Jewish people. Obviously, they came in contact with Jews some kind of way. Obviously, they studied their Old Testament and their prophecy in some kind of way, and which led to probably why they were called wise men. They were very well studied. Um, that's, they weren't believers, but they were familiar with it. Okay, And so they, um, as we're going to explain a little bit more, but they title the, the child is born, King of the Jews, the Messiah, the rightful heir to David's kingdom. The, right, the person who has the birthright to be the king of the Jews. He says, look, he explains it. For we saw, now, it says we saw. Now the wise men, we look upon, another thing we look at, we look at three wise men. And we look at three wise men because of the frankincense, because of the myrrh, and because of the gold that was brought to Jesus by them. And people have concluded it must have been three wise men. But no, it was more than that, probably. We don't know, but probably more than that. It was an entourage. And the reason why we know that, because when they came into Jerusalem, it was just three men. It wouldn't be a big scene. It wouldn't cause any commotion. But there was an entourage of people coming into Jerusalem, wise men, their assistants, their helpers, all that kind of stuff. And they're asking questions. So it was probably a good number of people to attract a great deal amount of attention, especially from King Herod, Jerusalem, and all the religious leaders of that time. So it was a lot. If they traveled uh, up to two years to get there, then you don't travel that far with two people. You bring a lot of camels, you bring a lot of horses, you bring a lot of food, you have things that are being traveled in. It is a big scene. So here we have, the Bible says, for we saw his star when it rose. The wise men say that they saw his star. Uh, remember what I said that the star or a moving star or some type of phenomenon with a star to the uh, astrologists uh, was associated with uh, a famous person or a special person, some type of royalty. And so they are saying when they saw his star and somehow they associated the star that they saw with the Messiah uh, with the king of the Jews. Maybe God laid it upon their heart uh, where they were going and who they were seeing. 
coupled with the fact of reading the scripture, being familiar with the scripture, being familiar with prophecy, maybe having a Jewish person help explain it to them. These were wise men. They were not wise and they were not uh, unlearned men, but these were wise men. Uh, although we may disagree with what they were studying as far as why they studied the star, but they were wise men. And so they said they associated the star with the Messiah, with the king of the Jews. Uh, and, they, and that propelled them to take on this two-year journey. It says, for we saw his star when it rose, okay? And we have come to worship him. So they traveled afar to worship him. A lot of times we complain about going to church and taking more than a half hour, taking more than 20 minutes. For them to go and worship Jesus took them just about two years. So I think we should not complain about how long it takes us to get to church or get to a place where we worship Jesus. Uh, we, ha we have it 15 minutes is nothing. Our, our, our ancestors went even farther. It took them longer than that. And so here took them two years, and there, when they finally get there, the Bible is going to tell us that they rejoiced. That they rejoiced, and that's how we should look at it. When we get to church, we should be uh, anxious and ready to rejoice. So it says here. So for when we saw his star when it rose, they have come to worship him. They want to praise his name. They want to bow down before him. Uh, they want to pay homage to him. Uh, they want to recognize and honor him for who he is. Uh, they want to be blessed by him because he's the king of kings, which is another word for the, the long-awaited Messiah that was prophesied, that will save the world. When Herod the king heard this, when they were, heard that they were asking questions, uh, uh, that the born, the king of the Jews had been born, where is he? Um, all those type of questions that they had come to worship, it troubled uh, Herod the king. Why would it trouble him? Uh, he's the king of the Jews, or the, the earthly king of the Jews. He would, you would think he would be happy. You would think the chief priest would be happy. You would think the scribes of that day would be happy. You think the political leadership would be overjoyed. But look what it says. For Herod the king, when he heard this, he was troubled. He saw this as a threat to his power to his prestige, to his kingdom. He sought this as another attempt to overthrow him. Remember, he was very paranoid, very paranoid individual. And the last 10 years of his reign was murderous. It was terrible. He killed many people, innocent people, his sons, because he thought they were a threat. Killed his favorite wife because he thought she was a threat. When he died on his deathbed, he killed people around him, family members and everything so that people would make sure that people would mourn at his death. And he died a terrible death, worms eating him inside, horrible disease. And so this man is paranoid, doing anything to hold on to power. So when he heard about the, uh, a child that's gonna be the king of kings, he was threatened. Because remember I said before, he was king by appointment, not by birthright. The Jews didn't even recognize him as a Jew. He was technically a half Jew, but in Jews eyes, if you're not full-blooded Jew, then you're not, you're not a Jew at all. And so the Jews did not recognize him. So he felt maybe it would be some kind of overthrow since they have a, a, a somebody with the birthright, uh, somebody that's a full-blooded Jew, something that everything that he's not, it will cause some type of overthrow. So it, so it troubled him. And so here, uh, and it troubled all Jerusalem with him, meaning all the political leadership troubled all those in power. It troubled them. It was a threat to them. I don't think it means the whole, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. It means all the leadership. And then what he does, he makes an unlikely alliance. He gets with a common enemy, the chief priests and the scribes and, and the Sadducees and all, all those people. They're not happy to hear this news either. And so he creates an unlikely alliance because before they're at odds. They don't like him. He didn't like them. But now they got a common enemy and they join together. So he, he assembles them. And he asked them uh, where this Christ would be born. And they tell him it would be born in Bethlehem of Judea, not Bethlehem of Galilee, but the Bethlehem of Judea, specifically what the Bible says. For it is written by the prophet. And you, O brother Bethlehem, and this is Micah 2 is saying, it's a combination of Micah 2 and 2 Samuel, uh, Micah, excuse me, Micah 
5-2 and in 2 Samuel 5-2. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. He's saying that this Bethlehem is a really a poor place, unknown place, but out of it will come the Messiah, the ruler of the Jews. He says, for from you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. And this ruler that comes out will be the true shepherd that will reign over and rule the people of Israel. Uh, and so uh, he hears this prophecy and, and understands it correctly. And Herod is really upset. He's terribly upset. So he starts devising a plan on how to make prevent this from happening. It says, then Herod summoned the wise man secretly. Okay, doesn't want people to know about what he's doing or, or to talk about it. And ascertain from them what time the star had appeared. So he asked them questions. When did it happen? Appear? How long did you get here? Whatever. And he deducts that, that the most it could be the child is at most two years old. So what I'll do is I'll devise a plan where I'm going to kill everything, every child that's two years and under. Or if I find him in Bethlehem, I know he's a two-year-old child. I, I know what I'm looking for. So he's trying to identify Jesus so he can go out there and kill Jesus. He says, uh, and he said down to Bethlehem. So he tells them uh, that uh, Jesus is in Bethlehem, points them to go uh, uh, Jerusalem is south of Bethlehem. And I guess he tells them to go north, which is about six miles. And he says, there you'll find Jesus. Then he says this, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me a word that I may too come and worship him. That's the tricky part. It doesn't mean he, he is not happy about the birth of Jesus. He is not happy about the Messiah being alive. Not everybody's going to be happy about Christmas. Everybody's not going to, reality sets in after Christmas. Because everybody, they, they, on the, on the, when he's born, Jesus is born, or the Christmas comes, you celebrate, you give gifts, but the next day you go back to normal. And if you're a hater of Jesus, you're going to continue to hate him. If you don't like Jesus then, you're not, you're not going to like him uh, after Christmas. And so just in the case here, uh, Herod is not happy about the birth of Jesus. He, reality is setting in, and it's just like us in Christians. When we become saved, uh, it's a joyous occasion, but after the day after we become, become saved, reality sets in, the world sets in, and we feel the hate that the world has for us. And here, Jesus, at, a, at, a, at less than two years old or less, is feeling the hate that the world has for him. We're seeing it on display. Not everybody's happy about the birth of Jesus and the Messiah coming. Okay? All right. Okay, so after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until they came to rest over the place where the child was. And the question comes up, but how did they get to Jerusalem? They were on their way from the, from the east. They were going in the right direction. But somehow, instead of going to Bethlehem, they went to Jerusalem. I believe that the star disappeared. It, it, I think the star disappeared, meaning that um, they were following it. It led them to Jerusalem, or they went to Jerusalem. They figured it was a place of Jews. These Jews should know where it's at, know where the Messiah is. And they're excited about the Messiah. The Jewish people should be too. And I guess they found out the contrary. So I believe that they got lost, or probably, in my uh, speculation, that the star went away. They no longer could see the star. And because the reason why I say this is that um, the star reappears on the way to Jerusalem. It reappears. It says this, And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them. So somehow it reappeared, leading them to where Jesus was. And this star led them right to the, not to the vicinity, but right to the house where Jesus was staying. The other thing I believe it is, I believe that I'm, it's consistent with Scripture here. It doesn't say it that this star was the only star. The only people that could see this star would be these wise men, these this entourage. And the reason why I say that is because uh, again, if somebody saw a star moving, there were other astrologers out there that look at the sky. They would see it. They would recognize. It, they may want to follow too. But here we don't see other people following the star, uh, especially for two years. And then we see that um, it disappears, comes back. They see it, but Herod and his men don't see it, and you don't see anybody else seeing the star. The only people that see the star is, 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 is that it appears would be just the wise man in the entourage. 
So I believe that this star was specifically for them, supernatural. Only they could see it and only they could follow it based on what's here. And so they follow the star right where Jesus is. And it says right here, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They were excited. They had waited almost two years for the, to see Jesus travel great far, went through some hardship. It wasn't an easy travel. Now, they, now all of it was, was coming into fruition and coming to an end. Now they were going to see the Messiah that they longly waited for. They were going to worship him, give him gifts, praise his name, and go back home. They were excited. And we should be excited, too, when it comes our opportunity to worship Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We should be excited when we have the opportunity to give gifts to praise his name, just like these wise men are. And I see why Matthew did not paint them in a negative way, even though they were misguided. God is bringing them back on track. And uh, they're... they're their intentions are good. They and God is ordering their steps, bring them to salvation through the birth of Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Verse eleven. And going into the house, now Mary and Joseph and Jesus are living in a house. Uh, uh, when he was born, they were born in a in a, in a manger in a stable. So time has passed. They're in a house. They saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell down and worshiped him. They prostrated in front of Jesus and bowed down and worshiped him and praised his name. They're teaching us how to worship Jesus. We should, we should prostrate ourselves before Jesus. We should be ready to worship Jesus. Now look what else they did. Not only did they worship Jesus with their mouths, with their bodies, now they're worshiping Jesus with their treasures. Now, I like about this because in order for them to worship Jesus with their treasures, they had to, and they had to be the, um, do this on purpose because they had to plan for it before they took the trip. Before they took the trip, they said, I'm going to worship this King of Kings. I'm going to worship the Messiah. Now, I'm not going to bow down, praise his name. I'm going to bring the best gifts I could. And this is what they did. They're teaching us how to worship. When we worship Jesus, it's not complete unless we give Jesus our tithes and offerings, our gifts from our treasury. We, a lot of people worship Jesus just by clapping hands and doing all that, but, then, but when it comes down to giving something of value to them, they refrain or they hold back. And this wise men are, telling, are, are helping us understand that we gotta give God from, out of sacrifice. That, I'm not saying what it ought to be, but it ought to be a sacrifice. It ought to be something important to us, okay? If it's not important to us, it's not important to God. Then, opening their treasure, they offered him gifts, gold. Gold is for royalty to kings and queens and princesses and princes. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a gift given to gold, and Jesus Christ is the king of kings, appropriate. Frankincense, uh, used in worship settings, a nice aroma. That this is appropriate, and then uh, uh, mirth that's used for burial or to make your belly smell well. As a body decays, it keeps it smelling well. That's appropriate for what Jesus is going to do his death, burial, and resurrection. Appropriate gifts, expensive gifts, expensive gifts. They gave Jesus the best, thought out gifts, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod. They departed to their own country another way. God spoke to them. God spoke to them. I believe at this point their lives had completely changed. I think they were no longer worshipers of the stars or, or, or it had anything to do with astrology. They had met the Lord, their Lord and Savior. They had met the Messiah. And I believe their, Lord, their, their uh, lives had changed. Completely changed. They're hearing from God. They're obeying God. And God is speaking to them and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod. God tells them, don't go to Herod, bad guy. And, says, and they departed to their own country another way. They looked at the stars and divided another map to get back home. They obey God. I love the obedience of the wise men in this story. They see the star. They follow the star. They want to worship. They want to give. It's a two-year journey. They steadfast, 
What faith did they have? They knew they were going to see the, the king of kings, the king of the Jews. They, they uh, get to Jerusalem. They go to Bethlehem. They worship him. They follow God's instruction to the T's. They allow God to order the steps, and they follow. What faith did these Gentile people have? We can learn from them, their faith, obedience. Okay. And so let's go on. So uh, just to go down a little verse, Herod's going to find out. But in the meantime, God has spoke to Joseph in a, in a dream, tells him to go to Egypt. So he takes Jesus and Mary to Egypt. The void was to come by Herod. Herod's going to devise a persecution of every male boy, every male two years, younger, two years and younger in Bethlehem. He's going to have them slaughtered. That's going to be 30 to 50 young boys slaughtered in the name of Jesus. God has a special reward for them, special crown for them. Okay. So uh, Herod's upset. That's what he commands. He's bloodthirsty. He's anger. He, you know, uh, it'd be, it's amazing. He has just a short time to live after this. And he's worrying about killing people and worrying about his throne instead of bigger and more important things. And so, but what do we learn from this? I think we learned that um, Matthew's theme is quite true, that Jesus is the Messiah for both Jew and Gentile. He's a long-awaited Messiah for the Jews. Uh, if you look in the uh, first chapter, verse 1, it says, Jesus Christ, the son of David, that's prophesied. He's the son of Abraham. He had to come from Abraham's lineage, okay? Abraham was the father of Isaac, uh, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah, all down the line. So he meets those qualifications. He's a long-awaited Messiah. Not only is he a long-awaited Messiah for the, for the Jews, he's also the Messiah for the Gentile nations. And Jesus, God uses these wise men, Gentiles, from the Orient, from the East, to come and to worship God and shows the inclusivity of Jesus' ministry, his plan for salvation. That's what it shows here. And, 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 it, and what else it shows is that how to worship. We worship with our mouths, our bodies. We also worship with our gifts, our treasury. Our, our worship is incomplete if we don't have a gift from God. Our worship is incomplete if we're not there present worshiping God. We have to be there. Well, I hope this lesson has been beneficial to you. Uh, I hope that if you're a student or teacher, that it helps you in some kind of way. This is a blessing to me, um, fact, especially about the fact of how to worship and, uh, and to stay steadfast and, and following Jesus. This tells us so much. And... Um, how God has a plan to reach everyone. And no matter what happens, nothing's going to stop God from doing this thing. Nothing's going to stop God from saving people. Even though people may, not, they may hate Christmas, they may hate Jesus, but God's love for us and his plan of salvation is greater than that. God bless you. Love you much. Have a great Sunday. Have a great Sunday school. See you next week.